Hello and welcome to Mormons, Mystics, and Muons. Today I've got Keith here. Keith is a uh, good friend, a former uh, somebody. So I met you, Keith, um, coaching. Actually, I think I came across some of your meetup, uh, some of the events you had on meetup, and then read your log. Um, yeah, so Keith Gilmore. Um, and yeah, I read your, some of your writings and I was like, wow, this is, this feels like I am reading like ideas that I was just around the corner from like crystallizing. And so, um, reached out to you and saw that you were, uh, a coach and did coaching for a few months. And so, and we've been friends since, and it's been cool to see your content and I've been wanting to have, yeah, just conversation on you on some of these topics, but do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about, yeah, maybe your, what you do, what you do, um, maybe a bit of your journey to how you got here. Sure thing. Yeah. Well, I'm Keith. Hello. And my journey has been one of self exploration and integration, and this is the journey of life. And my work has come to ultimately working, doing, I, I refer to it as psycho spiritual coaching and writing essays that are relevant to our world and in the realms of how to live ultimately and really how to work to stem the tide of cynicism, nihilism, and the forces of disintegration and to bring awareness to love, harmony, and the forces of integration. And this is the central theme in my work, my coaching work, my writing, my speaking. And so this is me. I'm here in service to hermit, human flourishing is how I like to frame it. I'm here in service to human flourishing. And anything that serves human flourishing in a good way, I'm here for it. I'm here to promote it. And it's cool to see you, Gabe, and see you, your journey and how you've created this podcast. Really, in the time we've known each other, you weren't doing this previously. And now you've created this outlet that it feels like is really speaking to people and getting people's attention and allowing you to provide your unique and nuanced perspective that I enjoy so much. So it's fun to find ourselves here in this particular dynamic at this particular moment. Yeah. Andrew, uh, when we did coaching, I like that it was, it was an interplay of like my journey, but also your journey and kind of where those overlapped. And, um, so it, it was cool to see, yeah, it's just the two parts rather than like a, a therapist or something, a blank, blank slate where you're just kind of processing or anything, but so yeah, it's cool. Been cool to see. So you are, uh, yeah. So what are the different roles outlets that you are occupying yourself with? Well, so one of them is that I am serving as the president of the Portland Psychedelic Society. And so this is a 501c3 nonprofit organization here in Portland, Portland, Oregon, that is dedicated to community building and education around psychedelics, which obviously are having a a major impact on culture 
right now and will continue to in a more deep and profound way in the coming years. And so I've been working in this role to help steward this organization that exists in kind of this epicenter of the psychedelic movement and seeing how we can help to really steward the unfolding of this psychedelic reemergence in a way that allows it to flourish and be meaningfully helpful kind of in contrast to all of the kind of hungry eyed investors who are seeing this revolution in mental health and ultimately in the entire fabric of society and asking, how can I make a buck on this? And so Portland Psychedelic Society is this community based organization that's all about, oh, how can we connect this grandma who has no experience at all and maybe read Michael Pollan's book and is curious about what microdosing can do with this person who has been working with psychedelics for 30 years and understands the ins and outs and, and everyone in between to really create this strong communal fabric that can actually hold the weight of this transformation that is in the process of occurring, but is still in its early phases and of which we really can't predict the enormous outcome that is going to come from it. Yeah. So we're, um, so we're both in Portland area. So for people that don't know, and you have to correct me, this is my understanding. So Oregon passed measure 109 like a few years ago, which, uh, legalized on a state level, uh, psilocybin, not in a medical model, which I think is good and is interesting. You know, you know, Michael Pollan in his book talks about, you know, the therapy side of things, but also like, what can this do for healthy normals? Um, I mean, psychology in general and mental health in the Western world is kind of obsessed with uh, just this negative end of the, of the spectrum, even though there's been some more focus on like, oh, what about positive? Like how, how do we move people from like a, a normative or a, a not depressed to even less depressed? So, so legalized psilocybin within uh, the container of a, so a facility with a certified, um, facilitator, uh, so they've got a certification, uh, program people go through and that, that just rolled out last year. Then I think it was what, like mid last year before people were actually, you know, going through facilitated sessions. So, um, yeah, correct me anything I got wrong there and then how involved in that have you been and how do you see that? What's your take on how it's been going? Well, one small correction or just point to emphasize is to say that psilocybin was legalized is I think ultimately inaccurate in it's the, the therapeutic framework utilizing psilocybin was legalized. So the substance itself still remains illegal outside hmm. of the licensed grow facility that transfers it to the licensed facilitator inside of the licensed service center. So I just emphasize that because P 
people will say, oh, mushrooms are legal in, in right, Oregon. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. So it is, it's legal within the, a facilitated journey with a certified, like a licensed facilitator at a facility. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then it's, so the mushrooms have to be grown in a facility that's right. licensed, and then it has to be delivered in a facility that's licensed by a facilitator that is licensed. Right. And then it's, I mean, things are decriminalized, but that doesn't mean not illegal. Uh, that yes. means to my understanding, lowest on the enforcement, uh, priority. Yeah, exactly. And that was a concurrent ballot measure that passed 110, which decriminalized all drugs in Oregon. So how do I feel that it's going? It's still very early days. And I, I think it's too early to tell. I mean, I think that ultimately, ultimately, it's a good thing that access is improving where people who may otherwise not feel comfortable doing something in an underground way are now able to experiment and say, is this for me and try it? You know, I think there's also downsides to the model that exists and in that it is kind of based on a more therapeutic framework and perhaps doesn't allow for more shamanic modalities or even, you know, just the, the joy of taking psychedelics in a space and container that is safe, but for the purposes of enjoying oneself and experiencing the, the ecstasy of the experience. And so it's one particular way of experiencing these things that ultimately it's good that the needle is moving. And at this point, there's no stopping the movement of this needle and it's going to blow right out of the frame. And which is why it's so important that this is being stewarded properly on a cultural scale. And ultimately this is going to emanate globally and be part of a major transformation in the social fabric of humanity, which is not to say it's going to be the only thing because we're also facing so many other rapid transformations in what it means to be human and you know ai we've spoken about before and that's another major transformation that is here and coming and there are many and so our responsibility i feel is to be stewards who are open-eyed and looking at everything and not putting our heads in the sand and saying everything's going to be fine, but also not falling prey to being doomsayers who are saying, well, we're screwed. Look at the litany of existential risks that humanity is faced with. Let's just give up. <laughs> but to find a ground that acknowledges the reality of what we face without marrying ourselves to a need for a particular outcome outside of the aspiration of let's bring about human flourishing in a good way. And so we're, we're here to be stewards and you're, you're being a steward in your way in with your writing and with your podcast and your exploration and the con conversations you're having and each of us gets to, if we so choose, which I encourage each of us to do, if we so choose, we get to steward our little part of the garden. And if we're all doing that, then the garden flourishes. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it is interesting to see. Yeah. It's interesting to see us moving and in some ways it, it seems 
too slow and in other ways it seems like breakneck fast um yeah some things and again you can correct me if i'm wrong that are interesting about 109 in oregon so we should say that it's still i mean it's in the same category as uh situation as marijuana in that it's still federally illegal um but is legal within this this certain avenue in Oregon. Um, so that, that'll be interesting when it looks like MDMA will be the first um, one that gets rescheduled um, before psilocybin from what I've seen. Um, yeah, so they still, that'll be fascinating, I think, both literally, uh, you know, from the just what will happen as MDMA becomes a therapeutic method, um, both with people's results and the awareness and I'm curious how insurance companies will, um, insurance companies and even like religious organiz organizations. I'm fascinated to see how the Mormon church, uh, responds to this from like a philosophical spiritual yeah so it'll be interesting to see both in the literal sense what happens but also just in the i think the philosophical sense that you know from a jungian idealist perspective like that the symbolism of that happening i think will mark a shift in where where we're going um our direction is society as a world can you say more about what you think the symbolic weight of that is mm, just in you know so i i'm an I idealist and you know idealism the perspective that consciousness is everything emanates from consciousness so physical matter space time um <clears throat> all arises from consciousness which sounds bizarre um, because it feels so real or so sucked into the illusion, the experience of it. So we don't really analyze the fact that time, physical matter, it's all experienced through consciousness. And we can just look at dreams to see like, ah, here's another example of how consciousness, you know, we're experiencing in a dream, you're experiencing physical matter. You're experiencing time, you're experiencing space, all these things. That is your experience. It's of a different quality, but it's all arising from consciousness. And so I think that a dream and, it, and a dream is also a perfect example of how one mind in the, the waking world um, dissociates into, you know, a dream avatar that you're following, but then you're interacting with other people, a world, um, everything just feels so separate than you, but ultimately you are connected to it. And they do does represent a part of you. The question is like, it's, it's identity. And, and are you the dream avatar? Or are you actually the dreamer? Um, so, you know, within dreams, you know, this is not my area of expertise, but, um, things are symbolic in dreams and, and dreaming, you know, evolved, We've been dreaming for longer than we've been speaking. And so that's the way that dreams work is they don't, don't work in words. Um, they work in symbolism and in archetypes and, um, and so things that happen in dreams, you know, that, that, um, black stain on the, on the sheet or whatever in the dream, like it could actually have some deeper meaning of something that you can't quite get at, or maybe you can, or, or, and so I think it's helpful to work in some of that to our day-to-day -day reality. Cause I mean, it does feel so real that we're in this physical world interacting with separate people experiencing time. Um, but it's important to recognize that, Underneath that, there is this connection that as much as we normally don't feel it, 
um, there's a way in which we are, there can be a universal consciousness and the things that happen around us, you know, the, the person that comes into our life and treats us a certain way. Um, it could just be that, but it also, maybe that fits a pattern and there's something deeper that reality is trying to teach us. So I think I view, I view things happening like, you know, the war in Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine, um, and AI, non-human intelligence, um, the, the mood, you know, psychedelics being in the zeitgeist, these are all symbols of a deeper reality for the collective consciousness. And so when something shifts, uh, it corresponds with something deeper. The other, the other thing I think that's been helpful for me, there's many theories of why we dream. I think they all, many of them have interesting use, but one of them is this PGO, I forget, ponds, something, something waves. And it's this idea that the dreams are actually this, these, they're the story that our cortical brain is putting to these brain waves that are arising from the, uh, I think the brain stem. So this older evolutionary structure that has some, you know, brainwave pattern of like shame or something. And then your cortical brain that knows all the, 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 the constructs It's like, oh, we got the shame feeling going on, you know, and then it throws up the, the dream where you're losing your teeth or you're at school with the underwear, uh, with just your underwear. So that what's happening in the dream is actually only the manifestation or how you're translating a deeper, um, a deeper, more fundamental, uh, pattern or frequency or whatever you want to call it. So I think similar way in like our conscious awareness of the, of the world is that these things are happening, but it's not, it's not just about Palestine and Israel. It's not just about Russia and Ukraine. It's not about, um, psychedelics, psilocybin and MDMA finally, you know, coming around, but, but it's significant of a deeper shift that we're experiencing. Mm. Yeah, I would say I agree with that statement that, you know, but I always quote the, the best framing that I've ever heard for our present moment is that things are getting better and better and worse and worse, faster and faster. It's just so accurate. And so all of these, these things that are emerging in the way of disintegration and the wars and the ways that the social fabric is rending where people are becoming more and more polarized and seeing one another not as fellow experiencers of the human story but as dangerous avatars of evil and all of the you know, the, the toxic pollution that is now finally, well, probably has always been catching up with us, but now we have the awareness to see the ways that it's impacting our bodies and all of these epidemics of disease that are skyrocketing. And then all of the maladies in the mental health sphere with the increasing depression and anxiety among the youth and suicidality. And there's all of these forms of disintegration that are gripping humanity right now. And also there are all of these forms of deeper integration where people are feeling called to be embedded in community more so recognizing the failings of the culture that has siloed us in these single family households with a fence that keeps everything that is not my family out and the ways that we're seeing the the failings of the 
brutalist architecture of cities that has prioritized function over beauty and the ways that we are allowing the psychedelics to reemerge these agents of reminders of our humanness that remind us of our profound interconnectedness and of the primacy of love and the ways that the internet has mediated a spread of information that people can use their own discernment to find others who are really speaking truth and feeling it in their hearts and the the wisdom that i feel like is accumulating to discern people who are actually speaking truth from charlatans who are simply trying to manipulate or make a buck uh and the call to feel reconnected to nature that we're feeling this call to come back home in the womb of the earth mother, so to speak. And so there's all of these modes of integration that are also simultaneously happening while all of these modes of disintegration are happening. And so this is why in my mind, the symbol of the Tao, the Taijutu, the yin and yang, this says everything that needs to be said. And if we can really intake that and be able to, as Carl Jung says, hold the tension of opposites, then we don't get disintegrated by this cognitive dissonance engine that our culture is, which is saying, wait, things are getting worse and worse and things are getting better and better. And that's impossible. So therefore I give up <laughs> or I allow myself to be taken over by some ideological stance. So I don't have to think about these things or hold the tension of opposites myself. But really, if we can embody that symbol, which says everything that needs to be said to my mind, it says everything that needs to be said and more than we can probably discern ultimately from it, then we can know how to operate in this space where, you know, the, the centrifuge is spinning and the weights are getting pulled out further to the sides. And so things are getting all wobbly where if we can pull it in to the center, pull everything into the center, then as it spins faster and faster, it's okay because the center of gravity is at the center where it should be and not out here where things are getting all wobbly and, you know, ultimately may fly off into space. Yeah. And I think, um, it's interesting because I think some people's journey is a slow integration over time of like coming to the center from these two polarities other people for me it was the opposite it's like for me things got so bad things broke and then and then they got better because they broke because they got bad because they um you know moving cross country divorce um going into therapy and psychology and you know just reworking my whole view of reality, you know, everything being broken. Um, that's, that's the only way that I was driven to, or could, you have to take apart the puzzle if you're putting it together the wrong way to, to put it together the right way. Um, but that means that for a long time, it'll look like you're going backwards and that things are falling apart, but that has to happen if you're putting it together the wrong way. So, so for me, yeah, it's changed my view on suffering or things going badly, uh, in that, like, I appreciate the growth that comes from it. And I, I 
see that the fire that burns down the forest is what brings the the regrowth and the only way that you know the phoenix arises is is from things burning down and yeah so i think that it is interesting that two people can be living in the same world but have vastly different views about it um and there's this book I talked about in, in my last podcast. I don't know if you've ever read Celestine Prophecy. Um, it's a it's a amazing kind of fictional story of like awakening and the different steps of awakening and, and talks about the different religions. And uh, but one of the things he talks about is the that these religious traditions talk about an Armageddon and talk about a millennium. Um, yet those aren't separate things. They're the same thing thing viewed by two different perspectives and it is very interesting and, and this will get into i think the topic of of sovereignty uh, it's been interesting to th see lately that there's a bunch of people that are in this space of talking about non-human intelligence and ai and um consciousness and psychedelics um but if you look at their x feed it's it's all the the doomerism and the, the secret government and the you know the direction that America is going and um, I was listening to a podcast and somebody yeah so they're in the same space so they have the same knowledge mm -hmm. um, a lot of the same data but they come to the opposite perspective from from me like I've never been more hopeful and more optimistic and more in love with where we're at and and feeling like better hope for society and that we're going in the right direction um and like we will get there like it, it is inevitable the the course that we take there um is not fixed but it's it is inevitable uh, but we have the same data set and it's really perspective is is the key it's it's how you look at the data set what filters you overlay on it. So I was listening to this podcast and somebody was talking about, yeah, America and Liberty and, and, uh, you know, and how we're going in the wrong direction and, and whatnot. And I was thinking, it's interesting. A lot of this comes down to like, what are you optimizing for? Uh, like what, what is the meaning of, of life? What are you seeking for? Um, and that really, that decides everything. So like science, I mean, you can, you can have logical, factual, um, concrete, mathematically solid formulas to talk about reality or whatnot, but that doesn't necessarily bring happiness. Um, and you can, so this, this person that I was listening to, I was thinking about, you know, if I had a conversation with them and asked like, are you happy? They would sit, probably say like, no, you know, I'm not. And if I asked why they likely say like, well, it's because of the direction that we're going, we're losing our Liberty, we're losing our freedom. You know, we're giving into this and that, and that's why I'm not happy. But there are so many other people that are living the same reality and they are happy and it's not the the liberty the freedom the free will we have isn't dictated by the state that you live in the the necessarily how much money that you have or what's happening in your external circumstances although those can make a difference and those can uh, reflect like how you're feeling inside you can have two people go through like um Auschwitz, you know, I think, you know, I haven't read Viktor Frankl's book, but you can have two people go through the same experience and the same childhood trauma. And one person can be really destroyed by it. Whereas the other person, you know, has come out the other side and, and have been full, so full of meaning and, um, hope and happiness from the same circumstance. So, so really I mean, your freedom isn't 
dictated by the government, what country you live in, what relationship you're in, but not like the freedom you have, especially if you view from a materialistic per perspective is like, you don't have any free will, you know, everything's deterministic. It's atoms moving here and there. And consciousness is just a epiphenomenon that's popping up. So like, you don't have any free will in that respect. Um, your only free will is what perspective you, you have on what's happening in your life. Um, and so th that's the sovereignty I think that you have is that you can realize like, oh, it's not what's happening to, in my life that's making me happy or that it's not. And really it's what I want is not, I'm not seeking for life to change. Um, I'm actually seeking for my feelings to change. And it's not like the money, you know, it's not that I am looking forward to all the money that, you know, someday I'll get. I'm actually looking for the feeling that I will get when I have that money and do all those things. And that feeling doesn't necessarily come when you have that money and it, you don't need to wait for the money to have that feeling. So it's really like bringing that sovereignty and that free will into context of that. It's your, it's perspective. Um, and I think life throws you through situations of extremes and polarities until you finally realize like, Oh, I can't control what's happening to me. The only thing I can control is how I look at it. Um, mm. and then, and then you're finally free, you, you know, and not attached. Yeah, I agree. And that's well said, Gabe. And I'm glad you invoked Viktor Frankl and man search for meaning. And I would recommend that anyone who just listen to what you just said, Gabe, and feels like, no, that's just not true. Read that book because there is no better exploration and explication of what wielding one's sovereignty can do for allowing one to bear the travails of life than that book because it's the most horrific situation you could imagine. And this man being a psychologist and understanding the human mind and being a brilliant thinker and going through the experience of a number of death camps and coming out the other side and seeing the people who really perished psycho spiritually in that state and the people who were able to get through and identifying what the difference was and that he would say is being tied to or embedded in a sense of meaning, which I think is right, but which the language that I like to use and that we're using here is, is sovereignty and ultimately wielding one's sovereignty. And, you know, the language of liberty has been very politicized. I stay away from it. Even, even the term freedom has a, a lot of the trappings of politicization and sovereignty. I think actually speaks to something more active, which is the, the wielding of the inherent power that each of us has by virtue of being a human being. And it must be actively wielded. Otherwise we are actively giving it away. And in my thinking in where I've come to in my own path of individuation and exploration and doing the work that I do, what I've come to is that sovereignty is everything. <laughs> it's everything. And it's what you're talking about. It's choosing. It's choosing to wield the power of choice. And in the context of the larger conversation, we're talking about of the direction of culture and the unfolding of the human story where we're seeing all of these dark, horrific things happening and, 
And again, all of these immensely beautiful and profoundly hopeful things happening. We get to choose because if I want to go down that path of darkness and explore every horrific thing that is happening on this planet Earth, I can spend a dozen lifetimes just scratching the surface. And but where does that get me? It gets me <laughs> as deep down a dark pit as I can possibly go. Is that what I want to use my sovereign choice to be embedding myself in, to embodying. And ultimately, what I'm doing is asking for that to be what reality is, what the state of reality is. If I'm choosing to focus, hyper focus on the darkness, in some sense, I'm saying, this is what I want reality to be, because I'm attending to it with my consciousness. And then I'm moving through the world as a being who is ultimately in service to the, the darkness. Now, I have to introduce some nuance here because I think uh, a sound and important argument is to say, oh, so what? You just ignore all of the children starving to death every day or all of these people being killed in war or all of the abuses and mistreatments and sufferings that so many human beings are going through at every single moment. You just ignore that and say, oh, I'm just going to prance around in this field of flowers. No, no, you don't ignore it it's important to look at it. And this is why having open eyes is the key for moving through this world. We have to have open eyes to everything and not put our heads in the sand and not pretend that this is not happening. We can't do that because that's doing a disservice to everyone who is suffering, which ultimately is all of us, but certainly doing a disservice to the people who are suffering the most so we don't pretend it's not happening, but we also are doing a disservice to humanity by hyper focusing on it. And in fact, if I can spend more time in this field of flowers than I'm spending in this dark cave, then all of humanity is going to be better off because I'm saying I want this for humanity. I envision this field of flowers that we can all lay in under a bright sun and be in love with one another and with the earth. It's calling it to existence. And if I'm using my sovereign choice, look, we all know what it's like to hyper focus on negative news stories. You start becoming depressed and anxious. It's that's just what happens. And when we spend time in nature, or we spend time with loved ones and we immerse ourselves in the things that bring us true joy and meaning, then we feel fulfillment and we feel that embodied sense of love and we feel gratitude and we feel these forces that help us to actually have strength to face the dark things and to say, no, we will not tolerate this any longer. And I am going to use my sovereignty to bring beauty into the world as much as I possibly can, because I understand that all of this suffering is out there. And because I've suffered myself and because I see the pain in my brother's eye, I see the pain in my sister's eye and Therefore, let's focus on the beauty that is awaiting us, because if we can envision that, if we can imagine that, then we can actually work to bring it to fruition. And I think this is core to this idea of sovereignty is the choice to say that, no, I will not give way 
to cynicism. I will not give way to nihilism. I will utilize my sovereign power, which is which cannot be impeded on by any force, as you're correctly saying, Gabe, to focus on bringing about human flourishing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think getting curious about who we are and why we do the things we do um, is key to this. So like that individual that I heard on the podcast that was talking, you know, very fixated on the direction things were going and losing liberties and freedoms, you know, whatnot. They already, I mean, they were giving away their, the only liberty and freedom they had in worrying about this. So, I mean, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and mm. they had the key right in that moment, actually, to gain all the freedom back that they could ever want. Um, but they choose not to. But it's not, you know, it, the, I think the key is, the reason why we do this is because we don't, we don't know, um, Alan Watts talks about this, like we don't know what we're looking for. Many of us don't know what we're looking for. Um, and so you know, ultimately we want happiness and, and peace and contentment and, and connection, but we often don't know that. So we seek for that in control. It's really not control that we want. I mean, people seek it for money. It's really not the money that they want. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's the, the happiness uh, and contentment. So, uh, people look for, they're seeking for meaning. Sometimes, you know, meaning is what they're addicted to. And being opinionated about something, having, being engaged in a battle is meaningful. And so, you know, that individual as, as much as they say, they're really concerned about, you know, communism or whatever it is, it's not freedom that they're concerned about. It's really meaning. And the worst thing that could actually happen for that individual is for communism to go away or whatever force they're struggling against, because like that is where they're finding meaning. And it's not, it's not anybody's fault to, to not have figured out what we're seeking yet. Um, and addiction as well, you know, Stan Groff talks about this, you know, that the, the alcoholic or the, the, the addict, I mean, they're seeking for this blissful dissolution, their true nature, the oneness, um, that because things are painful, things are difficult, um, so we're all seeking for it. We just don't know quite what we're seeking for yet. Um, so yeah, you know, with the, I've thought about this recently, talked to friends about this. Um, yeah, it's not that we stick our head in the sand. It's not that we ignore what's going on in the world, but we're like really rationally think about this. You know, there are atrocities going around everywhere in the world. Um, but we just choose to focus on one thing here or there. Is it because we're really concerned about that or is it because we're actually looking for meaning? And, you know, are we tweeting about something? Are we engaging in battles with somebody because we're really concerned about what's going on with the people or are we actually seeking a distraction or, or, or some self-righteousness, some feeling, are we covering for something that, some wound that we have filling some void. And if, if we can feel like, ah, I can't believe this other person doesn't see that this person is the aggressor rather than this person or whatnot, like we can walk away from the situation we're, we're using Israel and Palestine. We're using whatever it is for actually selfish reasons to, so that we can feel better or we're using um, politi politics so that we can feel better because we see something better than that other person. And so I think it's important to, to see what's going on. And if you're from a more dismissing attachment side, 
like, like I come from, like, yeah, f- feel the pain there in as much as it's useful, but then also recognize like where your sphere of influence is. Like, you're not going to change what's going on. You're not going to change anybody's mind by tweeting about something unless you really are, you know, somebody that's a public figure and that could make a difference. But posting your Facebook feed about something is probably not, you're probably seeking to fill some void rather than like see where the Israel Palestine conflict is happening in your family at work at friends, see, see where that same kind of like the dream, like view that as an archetype of some sort of interaction, some pattern, and then see where that the fractalized smaller version of that is happening in your, in your life. And then where you can actually fix it either in your body or in your family with your friends, um, rather than using that to distract yourself from the things that are going on in your life. I, I know some people that, yeah, they're more concerned about what's going on on the other side of the world than they are about how they treat their loved one or, um, and it's not, it's not their fault. It's, you know, we're all seeking to we're all wounded in some sense and seeking for the right thing. We just don't, we're not aware of our wounds and we don't know quite the best way to fix it always. Yeah. And this is why I think it's imperative that we inhabit a stance of seeing one another as brothers and sisters. I think this is key for us moving through this complex of dire predicaments that humanity finds itself in. If we can actually inhabit that stance that every single person is my brother and sister, then a lot of the enmity and animosity and hatred and resentment and these dark forces that drive so much of what we do as human beings will dissolve. And I think that you're right that a lot of what we, what we think we're doing when we're putting ourselves into the fray of the the so-called culture wars and arguing on Facebook, it's ultimately a futile act. Although on the other hand, I can see the importance of if someone really feels strongly that I, I see the way that humanity is going wrong and, you know, so-called, and I feel a responsibility to articulate this in a public way. Like I can recognize that impulse. I myself am doing some version of that when I put out my own, my own thoughts. However, I think fundamentally, you're right that what it comes down to is taking responsibility for oneself first and foremost, and also that that's everything (laughs) that that's actually everything. Because if I am able to get myself integrated and stop the war within, then I am not contributing to disintegration and war in the larger sphere. And if I can come to forgive myself, then I can embody a state of forgiveness as I move through the world. And that touches everybody that I touch. And if I can come to love myself truly and without condition, and say, I'm here for you. I love you. Let me act in service to you. If I can give that to myself, then 
I am able to move through the world and everything that I touch is impacted by that. And I think that is the, the fundamental ethical act is taking responsibility and doing so in a way that the heart is dictating what that looks like. So if we can tap into the dictates of the heart, and then if we can take responsibility, which is the underside of the coin of sovereignty is responsibility, then we become integrated and we move through the world and we call the world to integration through our presence. And then if we're going out and we're speaking or posting our thoughts on Facebook or whatnot, then at least we can know that I'm not doing this for egoic reasons. I'm not doing this to start a battle. I'm not doing this to piss off my aunt who has all these wacky ideas. You know, I'm doing this because my heart, which I'm in touch with because I've cleared my lenses away from all of the things I'm carrying that I don't need to is informing me that this is important. And this is how the world changes. And I would invite people to explore the the teachings and writings of Krishnamurti, if you would like to explore this idea on a deeper lev level, at a deeper layer, which is the idea that you are the world. And again, like you're saying, Gabe, I'm not going to stop a war on the other side of the world by tweeting about it every day. But I actually, actually, truly can play a part in stopping a war on the other side of the world by ending the war in myself. If I can do that, then I can move out and work to end the war within my family. And if we can do that as a family, then we can move out and start to try to end the war in our community. And if we can do that as a community and so on and so on and so on because we're so interconnected on the level of consciousness, yes, and just on the physical plane mediated by the internet and how much access we have to one another, then I change myself, I integrate myself, and everything that I touch is called to integration. That's how it works, I'm convinced. Yeah, it's, um, if you listen to any of Michael Levin work, he's a no. biologist at Tufts, um, but he comes from like a computer engineering, computer science background, but he works on cells and morphogenesis and how they, uh, you know, how cells know to create what they, um, end up creating. It's really interesting because he, I mean, he's not necessarily philosophical or doesn't take a specific stance philosophically, but he just, uh, yeah, he, he's very humble in what he knows, uh, or he's, he's willing to evaluate everything. And so, yeah, so he's, he's worked on, uh, morphogenesis. And so he, like, why do cells create, you know, how they, they've gotten a, a frog to regrow its legs. Um, and it's not by like micromanaging and, and making each cell go in this position and whatnot. It's about it's cells do what they do because they're, they're connected to like a higher vision from the collective, um, intelligence. The, the body, the full self, and then they just do their job. Um, and then the whole vision comes together. And so, so they, yeah, they regrew the leg by cutting off and then uh, I think putting it in like a, 
chemical bath or something that opened up the ion channels. It's all about bio, bioelectric fields and whatnot, but a certain treatment for like 24 hours. And then for the next 18 months, they don't do anything. And it just, the cells know what they're doing and they'll, they'll keep growing. And so, yeah, we don't, you know, we are cells and I think the key is, is recognizing that we're individuals, but we're also the, the whole, you know, we're the dream avatar, but we're also the person laying in bed dreaming. We're, we're both. It's not one or the other. And I mean, that, that's why I'm passionate about idealism is because this, this is where I think you can, um, objectively derive ethics, uh, where, and morality rather than, uh, you know, it's evolutionary. It's because of this and altruism is this or that. It's like, no, like we, I'm a, an individual, you are an individual, but then there is also a, a way to slice this where Keith and Gabe is an individual or like in a romantic relationship, like, you know, the one person is an individual, the other person is an individual, individual, but they come together there. There's a collective identity. So when you can hold both of those at the same time that you're an individual, and that you're also the whole, you know, the other person is also part of you because your identity is actually the, the union. Then, it, then it, you don't, you wouldn't hurt the other person because you recognize that that's also hurting you with your, your, your true self. Um, but yeah, and, and the, the fact that idealism is, is not just philosophically nice, but you know, scientifically in biology and, and physics and consciousness, like it, it makes the most sense. Um, I think, I think it's important. I mean, this is where like Christ didn't just say that the two great commandments were love God and love your neighbor, because that was a good model to like go off. It's like, no, like if you realize that God, you are God, your neighbor is yourself you're actually, this is just a, a construct. You think you're an individual, like the commandment is actually just one great commandment. And it's just love. It's like, and he, mm. he didn't say like, this is a good one to start from. And then you can follow the other rules. He's like, no, on this, like all the law and all the prophets, like everything that's written rest on this. So if you can just stay in touch with love and the fact that you may feel separate, but you actually are everything. You're the earth, you're, Israel, your Palestine. Um, and if you can hold that, if you can heal yourself enough that you can hold that and, and be objective as possible and try to go through every interaction and thinking like, okay, well, how would I, if, if at some level I'm going to feel what it's like to be on the other side of this interaction, I may not feel it temporarily now in time and space, but you know, the, I will feel it at some other point. Um, what's the best outcome for the overall good here? And, and sometimes like in, in marriages, sometimes or relationships, sometimes you do take one for the team or the other one takes one for the, the team. You know, it's not always that everybody um, in every situation is comfortable and there's no sacrifices that are uh, needed to, to be made, but yeah, it's, it's the interdependence instead of just, um, rabid independence or codependence. It's an interdependence where you are looking out for yourself because you can't just get lost and think that oh, everybody else has got my back. I'm just going to get everybody else's back. But you also are identifying with the whole and balancing those. Yeah. Yeah. I like the the term interbeing from Thich Nhat Hanh. And, you know, even I agree with what you're saying, Gabe. However, in some of it, there's a risk of it coming down to a, a calculation or some some sort of calculus, which I, I know is not the spirit of what you're saying at all. But just to to speak to that element of ethical theory, I think that, 
you know, this is an argument that's leveled against utilitarianism or Kantianism or any of these systems that try to boil it down to a calculus, I think ultimately is, I mean, this is where dogma comes from and, you know, religious rules are Leviticus is like a, a really complicated calculus, which ultimately rules and calculus around ethics, I think strips sovereignty, which is why dogma is anti-human. And again, I know you're not saying any of that. And I know, I know you as, a non-dogmatic person and this is more speaking to that that impulse in humanity to codify rules and even like you're saying with with the commandments when it's like yeah you can boil it down even further <laughs> jesus to just love <laughs> and and that's ultimately to me, what it all comes down to is love has primacy. And this is the message that I, I and many others continuously receive from the psychedelics is interconnectedness. Everything is interconnected and love has primacy. Love is everything. So I like the, the idea or the phrasing I'll, I'll paraphrase from Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements and, and many other great books, which is that you don't have to try to be good. What you have to do is to become who you are, integrate yourself, and then goodness is occurs by virtue. And I, I, the more that I've come into myself and again, looking into these things, studying these things, having these conversations, that's what I've come down to as well is that the heart does not lie to us. It actually is incapable of lying to us. And so if we can tap into the dictates of the heart, which we all have this spiritual center within us, you could call it then. And we live according to those dictates, which again is not being imposed by any external force or ideology or dogma or system of thinking. It's not being imposed at all. It's emanating from within and its essence is love. If we can, live in accordance to the dictates of the heart, then we will be good. Truly, we will be good. And this is the, the ask of ethics. And ultimately, the ask of life is to be good. <laughs> How can I be in a way that is good? And so the the to connect it to this idea of consciousness and how we're all tapped in to the field of consciousness. We all have this within us. So we don't actually need a system to tell us how to behave. Systems have utility in that in, in so far as they help to provide guidance back home to ourselves, back home to that knowing that we all carry. And guidance is useful because we move through the world. Our world is so distracting that our lenses get fogged up and caked with dirt and accumulate all this detritus that actually impedes us from seeing what the heart is saying. And so systems that have utility are ones that 
help bring us back home to ourselves. And for me, like be beauty and art is creating a, a world in which these are the fundamental pillars of the systems that we exist in where we're moving through the world and experiencing beauty rather than again, this brutalist architecture that chooses form and function over beauty and expression, then we are reminded of our humanness. And this is what psychedelics do as well. They remind us of our humanness and they, and if we can be reminded of that, that, oh no, I'm not just some cog in a machine, but actually I'm a sacred sovereign being and everybody else and every other being is its own sacred sovereign being, then we act in accordance with sacredness. If we feel what sacredness means, then we can't not act in accordance with sacredness. But again, we forget because we move through this distracting world and there's so many things vying for our attention and so much noise out there that we lose sight of it. And so we need these constant reminders. And that's a, that's a function that, you know, church as a concept like that's the the spirit of it. I think it's like you come here every week and you're with your people and you're reminded of sacredness. And so there's some essence of that, that we can capture from the, you know, the overwhelming complexity of doctrinal systems of religion and how that's all played out we can capture that essence of, oh yeah, how can we remind one another and ourselves of sacredness and do so in a container of community and feel the felt expression of love. And if we can do that, then we remember and then we act in a way that is good. What would you say, um, can you give me your thoughts on evil because i think this is something that um people coming from a religious background they struggle with in the sense um you know when presented with idealness uh, uh, idealism or oneness or interconnectedness or whatnot is like well, what how do you account for evil um because you know pretty fundamental tenant of religion is that the good stuff comes from this guy and the evil stuff comes from this guy. Um, and under idealism, monism, you know, that they, there's just one, uh, but people are like, no, this is, this is, you know, I know there's evil out there cause I've experienced it. I've seen it. How could people, you know, uh, do this to children or do this to other people um and any suggestion that evil doesn't exist is yeah putting your head in the sand or you know so yeah how what are your thoughts on evil what that means is it just the absence of good uh is it a force how do you overcome it? Should we overcome it? That's a very large question. And I think one that produces haziness for me, you know, Nietzsche famously advocated for making a distinction between good and evil and good and bad. And I won't try to paraphrase his philosophical exploration of that because it's very complicated and I can't say I fully understand it, but you know, I, I wrote this essay that you alluded to earlier and it's 
exploring this Buddhist tale of this boy who became a man, who became a serial killer, a vicious serial killer. And horrific and body count in the the many hundreds and when he was graced with the presence of the buddha he all of that fell away he he completely relented from this anti-human path that he was on and he transformed to become a great monk in service to healing and went on to help pregnant women have sound and, and safe deliveries of their children. And so this complete transformation, and of course, you know, and I go into it in the essay and those who are interested in going deeper can, can read that. But the, the essence is that it's the same idea. I, you know, I wouldn't go, go so far as to simplify it, to say that humans are naturally good or humans are naturally evil. I think that bringing that conception onto nature itself gets tricky because if we abstract out that, you know, we're all, if we want to take the idealist perspective that we're all expressions of universal consciousness, then it, it, it just gets tricky because at what point does evil emerge? It's somewhere beyond the lion killing the antelope, but it's somewhere, you know, it, 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 it's somewhere, <laughs> it emerges somewhere. And so it's a concept and concepts can be useful, but I don't know. I, I, I'm finding it is difficult to speak on this matter because I think the concept of evil and good and evil being contrasted is too limiting of a frame. And that really the conversation is about, are you living in alignment with your true self and your true self has it's, it's essence is of love. And so are you living in accordance with love? Are you understanding the primacy of love? And I think outside of that is where we get acts of evil. And I would go so far as to say that, and this is also part of the thrust of this essay I wrote is that no human being is evil. No human being is evil. Acts are evil. Things that are done are evil. And that's a tricky distinction to make. But the, the essence of the human being, human beings can be lost and commit acts of evil. But does that, that does not mean that they are a bad person or an evil person or a demonic person. Some people get very, very lost in horrific ways. And, you know, they have to ultimately be held accountable for those ways, of course. But fundamentally, we are all children who grew into adults. And would anyone dare to go so far as to call any child evil. I don't think so. If you're being honest with yourself. So where does it emerge? It's a concept. And, and in, again, it's a useful concept insofar as it's useful. So we can talk about these themes of ethics, 
but I would never reduce a human being to saying this person is evil. That is of their identity. Cause we are all, you know, and then there's that line from Victor Frankl, the line between good and evil runs down the heart of each person. We all carry the potential for these forces, but it's, I, I think the dichotomy of integration, disintegration is useful because if I'm integrating myself, then I'm remembering and recognizing the primacy of love. If I'm disintegrating myself, then I'm forgetting. And so where on that continuum am I? At what point does it become evil? That's a question for philosophers. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, I've, uh, I've circled back to find meaning in the Bible, um, that I didn't find before. And the, you know, the, the, the fall is interesting. Um, Terrence McKenna calls it the first drug bust, which I mean, it is pretty interesting. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the fruit of that opens your eyes and, and makes you become as God, um, being a psychedelic, I think is, it's a valid, useful, um, analogy, but, but I also think that, um, it's interesting that there's two trees, one's the tree of life. Uh, and then one is the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they eat from and when they eat from it then they're cast out of the garden they're cast out of god's presence they suffer duality and death um but if you think of it as maybe not the knowledge of good and evil but it's this it's the construct of good and evil or black and white dualistic mm -hmm. thinking falling from union falling from god being in the presence of god being god to going through this developmental process of like this black and white thinking, things are good, things are evil. It's not the knowledge of good and evil, but it's the, it's the, the model. You know, yeah, and everything's models. Nothing's the big T truth, but they're just models that are, have utility and have simplicity. And we evolve in science from model to model as we learn more and, and get better. And so, um, just as, so I view this as a developmental thing. So like, yeah, once we start viewing things as good and evil, you know, we fall from the presence of God, we're cast out of the garden, we suffer death, we suffer separation, um, because that's the way we're thinking of in these dualities, uh, it's similar to babies. Um, they think they have two mothers. They think they have a good mother and they think they have an evil mother. And the good mo mother is the one that gives them milk and takes care of them. The evil mother is the one that like you know, pulls the milk away and doesn't come to them when they're crying and whatnot, because it's so hard for us to think outside of, um, black and white. Uh, eventually though, those idea of two, like they just can't comprehend why would this, this mother also do these other things to me. And so they separate into two, um, at least one way of thinking is that they separate into these two mothers. Uh, but eventually we, we integrate that into, oh, like, I understand why they're doing this. And, you know, maybe it's because it's for my good, or maybe it's because of their, you know, their own limitations or whatnot. And so I think it's a developmental process. You know, it's, it's a helpful uh, model of like black and white thinking. Oh, I think we do the same thing with God. Um, you know, our, our heavenly parent is that like, oh, there's a good God. And then there's a, an evil God, which is Satan. Um, but the more we realize like, oh, like we are one, they're, they're the same and they're inside mm. of us. And if you, if you view Christ's, you know, 40 days in the, the wilderness, this mystical initiation and whatnot. And then Satan comes to him and, and quote, unquote, Satan tempts him to, to do what? To like do things that you yourself, your ego would want to do, like eat this, you know, turn this rock into bread because you're hungry. Like do this, show this miracle to these other people to show your power. Um, so it's, it's not some other force outside of us that 
is tempting us to do these things. It's for me, I think it's, um, it's the forgetting being controlled by the ego, forgetting that the oneness, it's not that we just deco here into everything is one and that we're not separate. Like we are separate, uh, but it's not holding that we're also one at the same time. And that, you know, you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have evil to seek after good or to pursue, um, love and connection. Like you mm. can, you can have, you can pursue love without having to like label things as sins or evil. And so, so that's an interesting, I think, um, difficult difficulty and switch of like, how do we switch from this black and white thinking to, to more nuanced, um, thinking. Um, and you know, I think there's, uh, not one answer to that, but I think that's one of the trickiest shifts because I've seen other people, you know, I went through a Kundalini awakening, had these like, you know, mystical experiences. And I was like, ah, oh, anybody that's like experienced this or experienced psychedelics or something like they get it. But then I realized, you know, I came across people that have had other mystical experiences, but maybe they had it through religion. And then they, they don't get to the point where they kind of unlearn that like dualistic good and evil. And then they, they kind of go further down this road of like, oh yeah, we need to vanquish evil. We need to fight the evil forces in the world. And so it's, yeah, psychedelics, mystical experiences, you know, that's, it's not a cure all to things. Um, it also involves a lot of unlearning and questioning and, um, so we're going to have to wrap up, but I appreciate you coming on. Uh, and it's good to have this discussion. Um, I'll put some links in the show notes, um, for your blog, but yeah, any, any parting words, um, parting advice or things that we should check out of yours? Well, I would say, I mean, if you want to find me, you can find me online, keithgilmore.com. I would say in regards to your last point there in terms of evolving beyond simply seeing things as black and white, I would offer that required reading for being a human being is the Tao Te Ching and really spending a lifetime puzzling over it because it's a puzzle book and it's, it has to be glance through the side of your eye. It can't be looked at directly, but this, if this is a, an invitation to release that simple black, white dualistic thinking, and that is what our world needs. So visit your local library, <laughs> pick up the Tao Te Ching and spend a lifetime puzzling over it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I listened to it. It's not that long. So I listened to, um, some good readings on YouTube as well of it. So, well, thanks so much, Keith, for coming on. Thank you, Gabe.